Hi, hello everyone and good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon in another session of the Literary Festival. With me, I have Leslie Chang. She wrote uh, the book, The Factory Girls. So I'll just start by briefly introducing Leslie. So. In 1999, she actually moved to Beijing, correct, where she was uh, for around a decade. She worked as a foreign correspondent for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, during the same time, she also uh, worked for Condé Nast Travel, Travel and also The New Yorker and the National Geographic as well. And so in 2004, she went to uh, Guangdong province, to the city of Dongguan, and there she spent three years accompanying two girls, who, who are Min and Chun Ming, and it's about these two girls mainly that the book that I'm holding is about. So, uh, I think I'll start by asking why these two girls in particular, because actually when you, when you met them, you didn't know where their life would would lead you only knew a bit of their story so why these two girls in particular yeah i wanted to um i wanted to tell the stories of a few women of different ages um so i was looking for a younger woman someone who hadn't been out from home very long and then i also wanted to look for an older woman who'd had a lot more time in the city and was maybe focusing on her you know getting married or the pressure she was having from her family to get married so i actually met probably dozens of young women in the factory town where i was reporting and in both cases when i met min and i met twin ming there was there was some kind of spark about them that made me want to know what happened to them in the case of min i had actually met a uh, Chinese reporter who wrote stories about women in factories and she and I told her I want to meet a young woman who hasn't been out from home very long and so her younger sister worked in a factory and she brought a bunch of her friends home and I had dinner and, and talked to these women and then I remember the first time I met Min you know I was taking notes really fast and and asking her questions and she looked at me she's like wow you're working really hard writing all those notes down you know and and then she laughed and it was just kind of this because from the outside when we think about the factory population we think of them as very grim and very tired and exhausted working these hard hours but here was this young woman who had a story of suffering and, and terrible long hours and yet she was full of spirit and she was full of humor and so we just connected and we just were able to stay in touch and I was able to follow her life for several years and we're still in touch actually. Um, the other woman, Chun Ming, um, as I said, I was very interested in the stories of how women um, date in a place like Dongguan where, you know, as you know, in the traditional system, people would often be introduced to potential mates in their villages and there would be family members, matchmakers, you know, classmates, a whole circle of people to introduce you to a potential spouse. But in Dongguan, it's a city of strangers. There is very few adults, like adult authority figures. Everyone's young, everyone's on their own. How do you find someone who's an appropriate husband or wife? So I actually went to the Dongguan Making Friends Club, which was a government-run dating agency, um, which is about as fun as it sounds. And, um, and I watched as they had a big group of men and women. They were all sitting in a circle, in kind of a classroom setting. And each person had to stand up and introduce themselves. And one woman stood up and she said, my name was Wu Chunming and I'm here today to give myself more opportunities. And I just, I love the way she said that, like it, it was, there was a higher purpose. It's not just, I'm here to meet a man and get married. It was like, it was a way for her to develop herself. And, and so I was really attracted to that. And then after the meeting, um, which was incredibly awkward because they had everyone introduce themselves and then the organizer who was like a 60 year old, you know, communist party functionary type woman, said, okay, now everyone can approach the person they would like to meet. And then everyone just sat there. 
<laughs> I remember reading that scene, and I, me as a reader, I was feeling super awkward. It was and so it was painful. A super yeah, and moment. I just wanted to stand up and say, "Can you just let everyone mingle?" Um, and then there were a couple of really awkward interactions, and then everyone just fled the scene as fast as possible. But I managed to grab Chun Ming, and I talked with her, and she was immediately like really taken by my project. Oh, you're writing about, and I just just described it as I'm writing about the lives of women, young women who are working here, and she was very. She was just really taken with the project, and so and so we were able to keep in touch. So I, I kind of think that, in a way, I chose them, but they also chose me because it, when you're trying to keep in touch with someone who's moving around and has a very unstable life, there has to be some interest on their part to stay in touch with you as well. So that's kind of how we found each other. But um, so when you first stepped in the in this city, how did you find about these places, such as the talent market or that making friends club? How did you insert yourself into this whole new world? Yeah, it was really just kind of following the lead of the girls. You know, um, I, I kind of I picked Dongguan because it's kind of a famous city for having really low cost labor, so it attracted a lot of really young men and women without a lot of educational background. And I was especially interested in this group of young women. But in terms of how I learned the city, it was really from the things that the girls told me. You know, like uh, Min was really obsessed with the talent market because she was when I met her, she had just gotten a good job, but then pretty soon she wanted to get a better job. So she was telling me all about the talent market. So I went with her to watch how she how she interviewed for new jobs um, and the dating. I can't remember how I heard about the dating club, but um, you know, once I heard about it, I was just determined to go. And I actually had to go through like some government officials to get to this dating club. You know, and they Seriously, must have thought it was very strange. Government officials were running yeah. this. <laughs> Yeah, because they were, you know, earnest government officials and like, you know, women are having trouble meeting men because Dongguan is a much more female than male population. So they were actually feeling somewhat responsible to do this matchmaking, you know. So the proportion, I think, in your book was like one to three or one to four, something like this. So yeah, it was really a big, I mean, big deal. Yeah, kind of the closest reliable estimate I could get was maybe 70% women, 30% men. Um, and that's because most of the women who are, most of the people who are working on the assembly lines were women, are women. Um, but, you know, I never found that to be a huge issue for the women. Like, they never said to me, oh my gosh, there's no men for me to meet, or every man I know was interested in four women at the same time. Um, so for whatever reason, people were able to find people. It's just, it was very hard for the women I knew to find a man who they felt was really reliable because Dongguan was a place where everyone was transient, everyone was from somewhere else, and people would often tell fake stories about who they were and where they came from, and, and Chun Ming especially, I can't even tell you the number of men she met who she started to date, and then, you know, how's it going with the guy? And it's like, oh, it turns out he's married and has children, you know, <laughs> he just never told me. And with one particular, she wasn't even sure if he was married or not. Yeah. And on top of all this, they also feel, they also have this enormous pressure from their family because they have to, because they are girls, their families want them to marry someone from their own province. Otherwise, if they marry someone from, I don't know how many provinces away, their family, families are afraid they will never go back home. So on top of all this, there was also this uh, pressure from families. But what was more interesting uh, in this family relations was when, for example, Min came back home, she had an entire different status inside her family. She was running in the house saying, oh, you should buy this or you should buy that. So c can you describe a bit how it was for these girls to leave the, their houses as a teenagers and then when they came back, they had a totally different position inside their families? Yeah, that was something that really surprised me. Um, so about a year after I met Min, who was maybe at this time 19, um, she asked me if I wanted to go home with her to her village for Chinese New Year and I was like, yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, having grown up in America but of Chinese parents, I thought it would be a quite formal and polite interaction and she would kind of fall back into her role as the dutiful daughter and we would be very respectful to her parents and so I was kind of preparing myself for this. Um, and as soon as we got home, Min was just sort of like, just running the show, like, oh, mom, you shouldn't do this this way. You should, we should throw garbage here and we should build a walk here and we should redo our bathroom. And she just had all these ideas and um, kind of modern ideas. She wanted to modernize her family and her village. 
Um, and her parents, rather than trying to discipline her, were just kind of accepting it, you know? And, and I found out later that, you know, for example, her father had some ideas, some like not very intelligent <laughs> business idea. And Min just told him, no, that's not a good idea. Like that is... And I think it's uh, a matter to say that these business ideas were actually were going to be put into place with Min's money. Yes. So it was actually her money yes. that was on, yeah, on the table. Yeah, but I mean, once she and her sister gave the money to their parents, the money that they had earned in the city, it was their parents' money. But yes, because it was a large amount of money, more than her parents would have made in a year of farming, they had a lot of leverage over what their parents were going to do with the money. And... Um, they also did things like they they encouraged their parents to keep their younger sisters and brother in school, and they said, we have enough money that we can support them. Um, so it, it was really interesting to me how quickly the family hierarchy was overturned because of money, because of the experience and the money that these girls had earned out in the, out in the city. I think one very important thing about this book is that you gave a whole new perspective because, I mean, when we think about factory girls, yes, we're talking about girls that can work up to 13 hours per day. They make 50, 70 dollars, American dollars per month. Some of them they have to send home. They sometimes, or sometimes they don't have their Sundays off. So we have this very, very sad idea about what it is to be a factory girl. But uh, there was this one sentence that you wrote that was like they missed their mothers, but they were also having the time of their lives. I mean, this is something unthinkable, I think, to think that these girls can actually be having the time of their lives. But so, and you give this whole new perspective, you focus very much on, on the other side of these girls' lives, on the dating. But these two girls in particular, they were, they were different, right? Because we're talking about two girls who, who never gave up, were always rising in the hi hierarchy of the factory. So do you think they were outstanding in that sense? Or it was really actually really easy for girls inside the factory to move between jobs and to actually move to better places? Yeah, I, was, I wanted to be careful when, when choosing them that they were in many ways representative. Um, so in terms of their background, they were very representative. They were from poor farming villages, their education level was medium. Um, Chun Ming had only gone to middle school, I don't think she even finished middle school, and Min had done a little bit of kind of vocational high school, but not certainly not regular high school and not college. So in that sense, they were very representative. Um, in terms of their personality, you know, I mean, wh what I think about this period in Chinese history was that they were extraordinary, but this is a time when so many people are extraordinary, you know, and because of the opportunity they have and the lack of opportunity they had in the past, people are incredibly motivated and incredibly open and incredibly hungry for knowledge and self-improvement. Um, I think this is really a unique period in Chinese history. Um, so in that sense, even though these two women I met, they were, they were both so striving, um, not just for money, but for some sense of purpose, for some meaning, for some beauty or some romance in their life. Um, I think their stories in many ways are, tell the stories of lots and lots of women uh, and men in, in a place like Dongguan. And I, I met many, many people who were on the, say the higher levels of the factory who had started out on the assembly line. Um, obviously that doesn't mean every single person who starts on the assembly line rises, but that there is a lot of mobility and a lot of movement and a lot of opportunity for those who have the desire to grab it. Yes, for example, uh, Min, she actually grew up in the hierarchy and she actually got an office job inside a factory in the, the Department of Human Resources. But Chun Ming, for example, she actually stepped out of the factory. She actually started to in, be involved in business. And at some point, some parts of the book, you actually dedicate to, to describing the pyramid schemes that were happening at the time. She, Chun Ming herself got, uh, got involved in one of these pyramid schemes. So were these actually really frequent at the time? People were so eager to make money that they would be so easily involved in those kind of schemes? Yeah, they were very popular and they're still very popular. Um, there's kind of phases where they get really popular and the government tries to shut them down and then they come back in a new guise and then they're constantly transforming. But what I came to understand about those pyramid schemes or those multi-level marketing 
kind of groups was it's not just about money. Like it's certainly the appeal is I'm going to I'm going to join this network and then I'm going to recruit a lot of people to be my salespeople, and then all my sales of whatever product. And it's often a really random product, like it's a air freshener or it's a skincare cream or colored contact lenses or some, you know, product. And so everyone who sells that I've recruited, I get a percentage of their sales. So if that actually continues to work, then you can see how you would immediately get a large amount of money if you've recruited a lot of people. But, you know, I think the reason why people are attracted to these schemes are not just the money, but also the sense of community and shared purpose. Um, and of course, you can see in a place where everyone's a stranger and everyone's just engaged in their own um, project that being in this communal group and sharing a goal is really so appealing, um, personally so appealing. And this new wave of, of schemes that are common now in China, they have this overlay of um, benevolence and charity and philanthropy. So actually, Chunming is still involved in these things. And she'll, every time I call her, she'll be like, oh yeah, I'm involved in this Russian financial scheme. It's really great. And then I, I looked one up and it seriously said, like the largest pyramid scheme in the world. Like those were the words on Google. And I, was, I called her right away and I said, you know what, this is like a scheme that has had a lot of problems in a lot of countries. And the way she responded was so funny and so infuriating at the same time. She's like, oh yes, many people say that about us, but it's only because we're bringing financial help to, you know, so she had like this long thing that was like, clearly she'd been programmed or taught to say this over and over. Um, so these schemes kind of have this, this uh, veneer that we're helping people to become more wealthy because the institutions that exist don't help them enough. Um, so they're incredibly resilient. Um, I hear there are also there's some in Macau as well, um, um, and and probably Hong Kong as well. I think wherever there are people who are, you know, like community but maybe feel that it's lacking, um, will be drawn to these groups. Yes, I would like to pick up on that on the idea of the sense of the community they would feel inside of these uh, enterprises. I would call because um, I like to, to mention that only when you first went to the Min's to Min's village, you realized why they felt so alone in the city. So there's uh, one phrase that actually uh, a very central phrase of the book, which which is I can only rely on myself. These girls, in the end, they could only rely on themselves because uh, in the factory world, the the jobs were always changing. Uh, losing a cell phone would mean losing contact to everyone. This actually happened to, to me, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, she lost her cell phone, so she lost ties with everyone she met. So, uh, and when she, only when you went back to, to the, only when, when you went to the village, you realized how, why they were so lonely and why, because can you describe this the, this opposition between the communal life in the village and then how it was for them to see themselves alone in the city? Yeah, I mean, what I always say is that only when you've seen the village do you understand what the city means um, to these migrants. And so when I went back with Min to her village, um, I, I said that she had suddenly had leverage over her family, and that was true, but at the same time, she kind of slipped right back into the whole village community, you know, it, the village in which everyone had her last name, everyone was a relative. In fact, there was this funny thing where she was chatting with the boy next, literally the boy next door, and um, he seemed like a nice guy, kind of nice looking, and I was like, hmm, maybe she'll hook up with this guy, you know? And then much later, I learned that he was like her uncle, you know, <laughs> even though they were the same age. It was like, so basically, she's in this complicated network of village relationships in which everyone is family and everyone she's related to. Um, and uh, there were some interesting scenes when we went, so we were there at Chinese New Year, and they had traditions like on the first day you visit, you spend with your family, the second day you visit extended family, the third day you see friends. So I would go with Min to, to, on these calls around the village and before she went into a house, she would think, wait, this is my grandfather's younger sister's third, you know, and like she had forgotten some of the relationships because um, they were so complicated. Um, so you see this huge network of people that she's part of and also the sense because the houses are very small and close together and she was never alone and she was totally used to that because she had four siblings, um, three sisters and a brother and her mother and father 
and I was there. And then in the course of the two weeks, various people would come, and I, I just could not keep track of them. Like, we all slept, all the girls, all the women slept in kind of three big beds. And every night I slept next to a different person, you know. I had no idea who these people were, but they were all family. Um, and so you see that this is the life that they come from, and it's very traditional. And now I see what it feels like when you go to the city and suddenly you're all alone, you know, and, and there's no one you can rely on. And your family loves you, but they're way too far away to help you. I mean, they would help you if you were desperate and starving or something, but they can help you figure out, should I go to a new job or stay at this one? Is this a good guy to date or is he not a good prospect? You have to make those decisions on your own. Because as you mentioned, often those advices were actually not good because we're talking about people that never, never left their own villages. So what do they know? Right. Yeah, so their, her parents' outlook is very traditional, of course, and so, you know, a young woman would come to the city and would find a job, and usually the first job they find is really not a good job because they don't have many choices. But, you know, after a few months, they start hearing, oh, this job is better and it pays more and has better overtime. Um, but, you know, Min, Min would talk to her parents about it, and her parents would say, oh, no, 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 don't lose your job. Like, because all they cared about was she has a job and she's making money. They don't understand there are good jobs and bad jobs, and there are thousands of jobs, and um, you got to find the right one. Um, so over time, she just learned to ignore her parents or lie to them, basically, about what she was doing because she felt it just wasn't worth the hassle to try to get their opinion when they didn't really know what she was going through. I just want to make a small detour in here uh, because we were talking we're talking about when these girls arrive to the city and some are actually drawn to the underworld of Dongguan which is a prostitution world and in the book you actually mention you describe one scene where when you went to a karaoke bar which was actually a front for a, prostit a, a, prost a, a brothel to, okay and also a hair saloon so it was something that was actually quite frequent to, to see around in the city, right? So, but to get inside, you, act need, you actually need the help of a man. You, you called an American friend you had in town. So can you take us to, through that night? How was it to, to and in the end, you actually talked to, to one of the girls and something that I want to stress is that in the end, these girls, they were out of their business, their work clothes, and they were just like dressed as regular teenagers. And that's where, where it hits. When these girls are like with the, the head on the shoulders of the men, and it just looks like the children of the, and the parents, but yeah. it's totally not. Yeah. So, yeah, Dongguan in China is famous for two things for being the manu manufacturing capital of the world and for being the sex capital of China. Um, and for a long time, I kind of resisted writing about the prostitution. I just I didn't know how to go about it. It kind of disturbed me. I, you know, I just didn't know what I would find, and I was kind of reluctant. And actually, my husband urged me, and he said, you know, everyone knows Dongguan is like the capital of prostitution. You have to find out about this world, because as a reporter. So I did call up this friend of mine, um, an American guy who ran a uh, lighting factory in Dongguan. And so he hooked me up. We, all w we went out together with a bunch of rich uh, businessmen um, who he knew who were just the most you know, not the kind of person I would normally hang out with, but interesting in this context. And then we went and, and visited a couple of karaoke bars that were brothels. Um, so yeah, it was, it was amazing because you've, you've seen this world from the outside or, or, you know, maybe you have if you've been down there. Um, so they would just basically parade all these girls in into the room and each one had a number on her chest, you know, on her strap here. And they were wearing evening clothes, like evening gowns. And then the men would just kind of pick their number, and then the girl would immediately come sit next to him. And, uh, you know, fruit plates would appear, and they would put fruit in the man's mouth. That seemed to be a big thing, to, like, put fruit in somebody's mouth. <laughs> Seems to be, like, a big activity for, for it the... It was supernatural women. the way they did it, <laughs> I guess. right? Um, but, you know, in the course of the evening, I was able to spend some time talking with these girls. At first, they were very confused about why I was there and wondering what... what my, my situation was. Um, so I interviewed them and, you know, what I found was really surprising. I mean, most of these girls were very similar backgrounds to the migrant girls in the factories. And often it was just who they knew in the city when they first came. And it, often they said, I had a cousin who was working here. Um, or they would say, I started working in the factory, but it was just too hard. I couldn't do it. So I had a cousin who was working here and she introduced me. 
and you know they were not hardened they were generally just young girls and sometimes they would start crying as they talked to me um, and you know but some of them were had were older and had been here for a while and they uh, they had a clear plan I'm gonna save this much money and then I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna tell everyone that I made it in the factory and then I'm gonna I'm gonna set up a shop and this part of my life is gonna totally disappear. And if, I think if you were focused, you could do that. But I think a lot of women um, just kind of lost their way and spent their money on nice clothes. And you know, the dream was always to find someone who was like a good man who would, who would take them out of this world and marry them. But you know, I don't think that happened very often. But you know, as in every other aspect of Dongguan, there was job mobility and the woman, the, I guess you'd call her, they call her the mommy, like the madam, the woman who kind of runs the girls. Um, you know, I asked her what she did and she was like, yeah, I used to do marketing and promotion. And then one of the girls said, oh, she used to be, you know, working in this same thing and she kind of rose up, you know. So in that as in everything else, there was a lot of fluidity and a lot of mobility if you were motivated. So um, I think now it's the time to talk about the chapters where you actually take us into your family's history. So in the first, it's almost like reading a, a history book in a good way, of course. Uh, but in the, the next times you do it, you actually take us with you into the village where your, your grandfather uh, had lived. And so why exactly did you feel it was important to write your own family's history into this book? Yeah, it started off as kind of an accident. I was on a book leave from the Wall Street Journal where I was working to work on this book. And so I had some free time and one of the things I always wanted to do was go to my grandfather's family village in Jilin, which is in northeastern China. And so I went to the village and to kind of talk to some people and there were, it was kind of amazing because he had gone out in the 1920s to study it in Beijing and then to go abroad to America actually. But the, the things in the village seemed like ancient relics, you know, it, it was as if so much time had passed and there were like, you know, mounds on the ground where my family had had, you know, houses and, and certain landmarks and things, but most of it had disappeared. Um, but when I came back from the village, I was thinking, uh, maybe there's a way to put this into my book about migrant girls because there are these common themes of, of migration, leaving the village for better life, education, how to get educated. Um, and that moment in Chinese history, like around the 1910s and 1920s, was another moment when Chinese really felt that they were modernizing and that their country was gonna be part of the world and that they had to prepare themselves to be modern people. Um, and, you know, as we all know, that project did not end in an optimistic way and there was, you know, the revolution and the cultural revolution and all these people who had really high ideals, many of them suffered a great deal for their ideals and their education. Um, so I, I thought it would be a nice way to tell the story of the migrants but also have a sense of history. Uh, because I don't think you can look at this moment in Chinese history without knowing what came before and I, I think what makes people value this moment of opportunity so much is because they know that in the past things ended badly in a different way. So that, that's why I decided to bring these two stories together. Which uh, I think it's safe to say that it was somehow erased from Chinese history. I'm right now remembering uh, when you described the Dongguan Museum and which completely obliterated this part of history. And after you left, you described there's this group of young kids who were going to enter the museum and they would have this totally biased, I would say, vision of history. And so you not only integrated this part of history, but you gave it a very personal touch because you're actually talking about your own family's history. And um, the thing you mentioned that it, there were actually common points between them, uh, because I'll, I'll just read one sentence. It's from a diary. The date is July 14. In the factory, when I have free time, I think of all kinds of troubles. I feel like a single, a single boat floating on the great ocean. Even if the heart desires quiet, it cannot be. I'd like to answer, who do you think wrote this? Any guess? Any guess? Well, it was actually written by your grand grandfather, but I was reading this and I thought it could totally be Min or Chunming, right? That's, did you feel this, this, this connection? 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, this um, one of the great things when you're reporting is you suddenly discover troves of material that you didn't think would ever exist. And one of these was that uh, I had the diaries from Chunming, and I was going through the diaries she had kept from the moment she first arrived in the city. And I was at the same time reporting my family story, and my I discovered from my father that my grandfather had actually kept diaries from when he went to America. And I was like, oh my gosh, I wish you told me this like a year ago, but I need to see these right now. And and it was really interesting to compare the things that he wrote and the things that Chun Ming wrote. And there were a lot of differences, but there were a lot of also a lot of similarities. And one of the amazing similarities was there was both this kind of strain of American self-help in both the diaries. Um, and some of the things that my grandfather had copied in his diary were like, you know, Marshall Fields, 10 Secrets to Success, you know, and these were exactly what Chun Ming was writing about with, uh, you know, Benjamin Franklin's Seven Rules for Getting Ahead. Um, so, you know, people have been going through these searches for meaning and success for a really long time, and I, I wanted to highlight those, those commonalities. And I think in that in that in that sense, the the big part of it were the vocational schools. You actually enrolled in some of the classes, and some of the things are quite outstanding. The way these girls were, the things these girls were learning, learning because taking a little bit back on something you said, these pyramid schemes or the factories, what they produced, it really did not matter. It could be the most random things because in the end what mattered was the personality and the, the abilities and the capabilities of the person. And so this is where the vocational schools enter. So can you describe a bit what was one of those classes? Yeah, I was really interested in um, these classes which were marketed as a way to prepare factory workers to be office workers. So it was really focused on etiquette, how to sit, how to stand, how to, I mean, they had, they had to practice like how to pick up a piece of paper from the ground and deliver it to your boss, you know, like all these bizarre little scenarios that they had to practice and learn. And so it's easy to look at this and to say, you know, this is total nonsense, right? But what was important was what the experience meant to the girls, and they really saw this. This was their chance to shape themselves in a more polished, modern way, to learn how to sit and stand, what clothes to wear to an interview, how to present yourself. And by the end of the class, the class size had reduced by a huge amount because so many of the girls had gone to the talent market and gotten a better job. And now they were doing sales, and now they were clerks, and now they were human resources you know, employees inside companies. Um, so it, it's kind of the same thing that when you look at the factory, if you look at what it makes, you can't see what meaning it, it could possibly have in changing somebody's life. Like you're sitting there for 12 hours a day making this, you know, gluing this piece of metal onto the back of the cell phone cover. Like what could be more meaningless, right? But to these girls, that wasn't the purpose of the work. The work was, what am I learning? How am I strengthening myself? How am I meeting people from other places, learning to talk to them? And of course, what money am I making? And what am I going to do with this money? So it was kind of like not so much the content of the class, but in a way, what, you, what, what the class brought you in terms of how you transformed, um, that, that was really significant. And that, that was something that was really amazing, at least for me, that these girls, I mean, I think anyone in their position would be giving up completely just doing their works. But these girls, they work 13 hours per day and somehow they manage to go two hours per night to school. They manage to go to English classes. They manage to self-improve themselves all the time and constantly. And it's, it's quite amazing to see this considering their circumstances so that I think, and I think you could really show that really, really well. And I'm curious, uh, did these girls read the book before it was published? Um, so I had written several articles about Min, one of the young women in, that appeared in the Wall Street Journal. Um, so I had those translated into Chinese by my, one of my assistants, and I showed her all the articles. Um, and then there's a scene I describe in the book where I brought the document to Min, and we sat down in a juice bar, and she sat there and read it, and I was just totally, I mean, this is the worst experience as a, as a writer, right? Watching somebody read your work. So I just sat there watching her, and then she finished, and then she finished the last page, and then she turned it over, looked at the back, and then she said, that's it? And I said, yeah, like, 
And she's like, well, what happens next? And I said, I don't know. You tell me this is your life. And she kind of gave me this funny look. Um, and then she said, you reported it exactly as it happened. And I was like, oh, my gosh. I'm so, so relieved. Um, so, you know, I had some of her approval that this, she understood what this project was. Um, and it made me feel much better. But I wasn't able to have the whole book translated before it was published. So when it was published in China, which was about five years after it was published in the States, I, had, I gave copies to both Min and Chun Ming, and um, I asked them to look at it. And um, you know, if they had any problems, I could change it for the next edition, you know, which isn't perfect. Um, so you know, they, they, Chun Ming had very positive reactions. I actually had a lot in the book about her personal life and her dating and affairs she, with people she met online. And, and of course, I said to her, I'm, you know, I'm going to write about all this. Are, there, is, are you comfortable with all this? And she said, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, she's very open. And then when the book came out and she read it, she just said, oh, I'm so happy that you captured this time in my life. Um, you know, she just felt like it was this, this document of this period in her life, which is how I saw it as well. Um, and then Min was fine with it. There was you know, as a, as a writer, you never know what people are going to object to in your work. Um, so she, there was a one scene in the book where I, I describe how her older sister went home to her village with a boyfriend who is not from their province and how her mom was upset about this. And, and Min said to me after she read the book, she said, well, my sister ended up marrying somebody else and they're having kind of marital problems right now. And if he sees this book, he's gonna be really upset that you wrote about this other guy that she dated like six years ago. <laughs> so could you please change it so that it doesn't identify her? And so I did, you know, I changed the name in the village so that you can't link it to her. Not that you could probably have linked it to her sister anyway. Um, but you know, so people have their own preoccupations, but in general, they felt like, you know, things in China are changing so fast that it was almost like a historical moment, like the 2000s is like a historical moment. Um, so they were happy that this moment had been captured in writing for them. So when you finished writing the book, um, so when you finished telling their stories, so many things have happened also because when you, you did not meet them uh, since the moment they arrived in the city, you met them, Min was already in the city for uh, one year, I think, and Chun Ming had been or they're over 10 years, I think. So, and, but yet you describe their life since the moment they entered the city until, well, sometimes later. So do they realize how much they have grown, how much their lives have changed? Was this moment some sort of realization for themselves that, whoa, I've actually accomplished a lot. I should be proud of, them, of myself. Yeah, I mean, that, that was one of the most amazing things about being there is people, things were happening so fast to them that people often didn't register, like, I'm a to totally different person than I was one year ago or two years ago. And the things I aspired to then, I'm or I've already achieved, but I'm already moving on and wanting something else, you know. Um, so, yeah, having ha being able to read this, this text made them see, oh my gosh, I can't believe I was that person. They'd always say, I was so stupid, I can't believe how stupid I was, you know, or I was so young. Um, but, I mean, that's one of the things that makes writing about China now so rewarding is because things are changing and because there aren't that many people who are documenting the change because they're going through it themselves um, so quickly. So just to be kind of a bystander and to watch what's going on and to write it down is, is just an amazing experience and privilege, really. So I think it's time to open the floor. Does anyone have a question to Leslie? Don't be shy. Hello. Um, I read Factory Girls a couple of years ago, and then when I realized, well, not that long ago, but as soon as I, about three and a half years ago, and then when I thought, knew you were coming, I started reading it again because I couldn't remember everything about it. And we've been talking about the relationships of, of um, well, the big difference, the 70-30 proportion of men and women working in the factories and work in, in the actual city of Dongguan. And one of the things that you also said in the book, that the girls said, at one point, because they have grown so different, you talked about it when you go back to the village, when she goes back to the village, and she's sort of the one running the house because she's the breadwinner, she's making more money than her father is, so she has some sort of ascendancy. Now with men, you also mentioned this in the book, that at one point, going back to the village and marrying the village boy doesn't satisfy them 
so much in that sense, but also the city men look down on them still. So this must, at one point, this difference, they've grown, they've matured, because at one point, I think it's Min, I think, who says, goes to visit her friends and says, oh, am I, am I not more mature? Haven't I grown? So they've grown apart from their friends in the village, but haven't quite got to the stage of marrying the city men. And also, besides the pressure of marrying, which you were mentioning, marrying somebody from the province, from the village, do you know any, how has that worked out throughout these years, from when you met these girls till now, because it's always changing, as you said, it changes, 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 all these years later, how have these women managed? Yeah, I think that um, this idea that the migrants had that you have to marry someone from your own village and this idea that their parents had, of course, I think that's changed a lot because, and a big reason is just the transportation infrastructure has changed, you know, because in the traditional way, a daughter would marry into her husband's family and then she would be there and then if you wanted, and then she would come back at certain times to visit her, her mother and father and their family and her family. But that only works if your villages are right near each other, right? Um, so her parents, you know, Min's parents' worry was that if she marries someone from another village, I'll never see her again because I'm, a, I'm never going to get on a plane and I get, they wouldn't even talk about the plane, they would just say I get car sick, you know, so they can't go anywhere. Um, but of course what happened was Min married, ended up marrying somebody from another province and then they did well, they bought a car and then they would drive home to visit her parents and then the drive between her parents' village and his parents' village was maybe six hours, which they could do in half a day. So these very things that seemed insurmountable in 2004 to these parents, you know, now, whatever, 2014, are really normal, you know, and I just talked to Chunming recently, and, and she said, you know, it used to take me 20 hours to take a train home to the small village in Hunan province, and now it takes me six hours on the high-speed rail, you know, so, you know, a lot of these traditional ideas are being broken down by modern way, by modern ideas, but also by modern infrastructure, um, so, I think that it's much more common to marry, for migrants to marry migrants from other places and for it not to be a big deal for their families anymore. But of course the search to find someone who suits you is always, is always a struggle in any society and um, you know one of the issues Min had with the man she married was that she turned out to be much more capable than he and so he was he's been having a lot of problems where he doesn't feel like she respects him enough and you know i mean it's it's a very you know recognizable problem right so so all these changes also bring new new stresses um into their personal lives will we maybe have a follow-up on their stories i don't know it depends i mean i i'm still in touch with min and Chunming, and they're continuing to have a lot of ups and downs and improvements and changes so we'll just see how things develop, but uh, you know, I'm good friends with them, so I, I always want to know what they're doing and keep up with them. Any other questions? Hi, uh, well, I was quite interested in your experience in the brothel, and because before I was also trying to do some research here in Macau for the prostitute, but I find it's quite hard to interview the girl unless I have to pay something for the private room so that we can have a space to talk. And I was wondering that how do you introduce yourself to them and how do you um, really open your conversation? Um, you know, I always try to be very straightforward about who I am. So I will just say I'm, a, I'm an American journalist and I'm writing a book about women's lives and I want to know about your life. And, you know, if they don't want to talk to me, then they don't talk to me. But generally, people are kind of somewhat interested or curious. I mean, because Chinese tend to be quite shy, they will often say, oh, my life's not interesting. And then they talk to you for two hours, and it's like, wait, that's pretty interesting. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's best to be honest, especially as a journalist or writer. You don't want to mislead people. And, and I always have my notebook out so they can see I'm writing things down. And... And at the end, I'll get their phone number in case I have any follow-up questions. You know, I'll ask them, especially if, if they're in this profession, I'll say, are you okay with my using your name? Or do you want me to change your name? Or do you have an English name that, you know, people won't know you by? Or, um, But, yeah, I, I don't know how the situation is in Macau. I, I think it might be complicated because it's really connected to the 
the big institutions, the casinos and the hotels, so it might be hard to get access and they're not that welcoming to you. Um, but in Dongguan, most of these places were pretty small and informal, so you could just go to one of these KTVs and as long as you're with people and you're paying whatever the fee is to sit down and, and have a beer or whatever, nobody's going to bother you as you're talking to these girls, these women. Any more questions? Uh, yeah. Hello. Uh, as an Asian American uh, woman that uh, went back to China and also to the Middle East, um, obviously um, all these young women that you've met, uh, the issue of female identity is very important. And how do you feel compared, it, uh, compared to your perspective because you grew up you know, in the West? Uh, that these uh, young women uh, from both ends, from China, from the Middle East, you know, struggling for survival. Do you feel it's sometimes it's like more of a survival issue or is it also a feminine identity issue? Uh, yeah, I would, I would say they're all very different. Um, one thing that struck me about the women who I was interviewing in China was they, they never brought up the female identity issue and they would, if they, if they thought that they were um, discriminated against in any way, it was being a rural person in the city. That was kind of their reference point. Um, and that I want to become more like a city person so I don't get treated like a rural person. But they never said I'm mistreated or I'm treated worse or I'm paid less because I'm a woman. Um, that was just not part of their consciousness. Um, I, I think, you know, there is a there is growing consciousness in China and certainly among educated women and, and progressive activist women um, where that is a concern and, and a focus. But among this group of women, I never, I never ever heard that. And I was curious to hear it, but I never heard it. Um, in the Middle East, it's really different. I mean, I, was, we lived, I lived in Egypt for five years and my new book is about working women in Egypt. Um, there, you can't get away from the female identity. I mean, basically, because you're a woman, there are so many things you can't do as an Egyptian woman. You, you need your husband's permission to go work, often to leave the house, even to visit your family members. Um, so you can't get away from the idea that your identity is defined to a large part by your gender. Um, but there as well, at least among the women I was meeting, you rarely heard life is really unfair because I'm a woman what you heard was, I have to do it this way because I'm a woman, you know, and, and, you know, of course you would meet really unusual people and certainly among the educated elite, you would hear, you know, life here is really unfair for women and I, I'd like to change this however I could or I'd love to see it changed. Um, but among the kind of working class and rural people I was meeting, there was the acknowledgement of difference but not the sense that they could do anything about it, basically. Okay, we don't have time for more. Thank you very much for joining us and thank you very much, Leslie.